senior advisor to the KRG Prime Minister from 2002 until 2004 when he was appointed Minister of State. This is all very important stuff, as you will find out, but also he is an incredibly passionate fan of Br Barcelona soccer. <laughs> and somehow I think that has more to do with than just with sports. Um, he also earned his first degree in English literature, which just goes to show folks, especially you young people, that the future is with the humanities. This is a man of art and music. <laughs> Minister Falah Mustafa Bakir, welcome. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished members of the World Affairs Councils of America. Thank you for hosting me and thank you for, thank you for hosting this event and for inviting me and giving me the honor and pleasure of being with you. I come from Erbil, the capital of Kurdistan region, an area that does not have a lot of tradition of democracy or human rights rule of law or social justice. We live in a very difficult neighborhood. History has been unjust to us, but sometimes world politics is also unjust to us. But we have never lost hope. We've always been, and we will continue to be, a culture of hope and optimism. We believe in our cause, and we know that it's a just cause. That's why we will continue struggling to get what you and other democracies have taught us, that freedom is worth fighting for and sacrificing for. It's sad on the 25th of September this year when over three million people went to the ballot boxes to exercise a very democratic right, the right to self-determination, to tell the whole world peacefully and democratically that we want to, to be free and independent. The next day, that was met with aggression. People did not welcome it. People started to take punitive measures against us to close our borders, to close the airspace, stop international flights, and impose economic sanctions on us. Therefore, we realized that we did the right thing because we knew that freedom was worth fighting for. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Our relationship with the United States goes back a long time ago, but if I take back a turn in history in 1991, after the first Gulf War, we had an opportunity and we rose against the Saddam Hussein regime, a regime that we have suffered under its rule. 4,500 of our villages were destroyed. 8,000 Barzanis disappeared. 12,000 Faili Kurds disappeared. And chemical gas was used against us as a result of which we lost 5,000 people only in Halabja and the notorious, notorious Anfal operations carried out in Kurdistan, whereby we lost more than 182,000 people. All these crimes were committed against us because we were Kurds and we were fighting for our rights. And we were always told that we were brothers and we were Muslims. So imagine if you have such a brother and such a faith and this is how you are treated. And the very word anfal is the name of a verse in Quran. This is where Muslims were fighting infidels. They were beheading the men, taking women as slaves, and their properties as spoils of war. This was how the Arab regime in Baghdad treated us in Kurdistan. In 1991, the United States came to support us to provide protection. We were able to build a democracy. 
I'm not claiming a perfect democracy, but we started to be on the journey towards achieving democracy. As you all know that democracy is not a package or a gift to be handed over the next day to find yourself to be democracy. There has to be a culture of de democracy, the culture of tolerance, acceptance, and believing in each other's rights. It was not easy, because at that time when we decided to go and conduct and have an election, nobody supported us. Everybody told us don't do it, including at that time the United States. Our problem is our geography. Kurds are divided between or among Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. So we don't have access to the sea. We don't have access to another country that does not have Kurdish population. Therefore, no matter what we do, all these countries will be united against us. And this is exactly what happened on 25th of September when Iraq Iran, Turkey, and to a lesser degree, Syria, because Syria is already a mess itself. <clears throat> we were able to come a long way, and we have indeed come a long way thanks to the protection that was provided by the United States. Therefore, we are forever grateful for the support and protection that has been provided by the United States in our journey from 1991 onward. But in 2003, we had an opportunity after the unfortunate September 11 terrorist attack on the United States, which is also a date that we share. 11th of September 1961, the Kurdish revolution in Iraq started. This is a day when Kurdistan was bombarded by Iraqi Air Force. We realized there was an opportunity to free the country from the tyranny of Saddam Hussein and for us to build a country of our own that we feel that we belong to it. From 91 until 2003, we were almost independent. We had our own international relations, trade, parliament, and government. Yes, we were not recognized by the UN, and we did not have, and we still do not have a seat at the UN in New York. But we had every other thing because we were not under the control of Saddam Hussein regime, but we were administering a region of our own. We thought that this is a, a good opportunity to go back to Baghdad and build a federal, democratic, and pluralistic country. And this is what the United States and other coalition partners promised us. And we started the journey. We drafted a constitution. We believed in that constitution to ensure power sharing and wealth sharing and a prosperous future. But unfortunately, those who came to power they did not believe neither in democracy nor in power sharing, neither in wealth sharing. Day after day, our life has become difficult. Taking it from the simplest thing, Kurdish, which has been recognized in the Constitution, Kurdish and Arabic to be the official languages of the country, they have never respected that and never wanted it. Nor in treating our Peshmerga, which is part of the Iraqi national defense system, which should have been paid for, armed, trained, and equipped, they did not allow it. No hydrocarbons law, no revenue sharing law, and nothing related to Kurdish rights. It continued to a date when we realized that we do not have any future in the country. Therefore, the leadership thought that we have to go our own way and we have to go to the ballot boxes for the people to decide their future. The whole world told us, told us not to do it. The United States, United Kingdom, EU, neighboring countries. But we told them that we have to. We don't see any future in the country. Some were telling us it's not the right time. But when we asked when is a good time, when can we do it? We did not get an answer. In Bratislava, in April this year, I met, and also last year, I met with many foreign ministers of the newly established states. I explained to them, they said this was exactly the same thing we were told. This is not the right time. So we don't know when is the right time for a nation that wants to be free. We knew that it was not a risk-free process. We knew that there would be embargo, there would be punishment. But we were not expecting that 
Iraq would be allowed to use force against Kurdistan, and especially American-provided weapons to Iranian-backed Shia militias to use it against us. This is what disappointed us, and this is why we paid a huge price. As a result of that, we have lost territory, control over oil, and also militarily, we were pushed back. But Iraq felt strong because it, has the, it had the support of the whole world behind them to tell, the, to tell us not to do it. And we've been punished, and it was too much for us. But we still have hope, and we still believe that one day we will be free. Three and a half years ago, or at the beginning of 2014, the then Prime Minister Maliki cut the budget of Kurdistan unlawfully and unconstitutionally. Nobody told the Prime Minister, why, are you, why aren't you paying the region their fair share of the budget? June, same year, ISIS emerged, and ISIS is an Iraqi organization. It has not come, as my prime minister says, from another planet. It came into being in Iraq as a result of the wrong and distorted policies of the sectarian Prime Minister Maliki. <clears throat> so ISIS came, and all of a sudden, we found ourselves to have a front line which was 1,050 kilometers long against the most brutal terrorist organization. So no budget coming from Baghdad, and to be at war against ISIS. And we also welcome nearly 2 million refugees and IDPs, refugees from Syria and IDPs from the rest of Iraq. And on top of that, oil, which was our only revenue, the prices from 100, 110 went down to 30 and 20. And in addition to that, Iraq was chasing our case and taking us to the court, and we were not able to sell that on oil in the oil market. But we believed in our future, and we fought, and we thanked the United States for saving Erbil and for standing by us and for forming an international coalition of 73 nations and organizations by today. But that has been a costly war. We have lost 1,846 Peshmerga, 10,447 wounded and 62 missing Peshmerga. Mosul would not have been liberated without the Peshmerga. And last year, we allowed for the first time in 25 years the Iraqi army to enter Kurdistan region. And we helped them and we started the first phase of Mosul liberation. But unfortunately, Baghdad forgot that, and the rest of the world forgot about the success in Mosul because we, were, we played the role at the beginning to break the first defensive lines of ISIS. They also forgot that hosting nearly 2 million people in Kurdistan, it constituted 30% increase of our population. But because two and three decades ago, we were refugees ourselves and we were displaced. We felt their pain and we knew what it meant to be a refugee. That's why we opened our doors. We opened our doors for these people regardless of their ethnic, religious, or sectarian background. While the government in Baghdad deliberately closed the checkpoints of Baghdad, did not allow the Sunni Arabs to go there. But we are proud of the role we have played in the fight against ISIS because we believe in tolerance, we believe in peaceful coexistence, and also a bright future. We believe in humanity, and we believe that we share in humanity and not in religion or sect, and we do not close or open the door based on that. For us, it was too much to be at war, but also at, in peace at the same time, to have no economic support. But we believe that future will come, and therefore we decided that after ISIS, there needed to be a political plan. 
even before we started the military plan, we insisted that there needs to be a political plan for the day after. Unfortunately, at the time, Baghdad was not interested and still is not interested. Baghdad still has not dealt with the root causes of the problem or the, root, the reasons that led to the emergence of ISIS. That's why ISIS has been militarily defeated, but we don't believe that's the end of it. Yes, it has got economic, social, cultural dimensions, but at the same time, without a political plan to embrace these communities, without reconstruction of these areas, without securing these areas and sending these people home, we can't say that ISIS is over. This will be a generational fight and it needs all of us work together in order to face it. Today we are in a very difficult situation. Baghdad does not stop. It continues to put more pressure on Kurdistan region and now they try to dismantle KRG as an entity. This is why I'm in the United States this week in order to tell the officials here that you need to tell Baghdad enough is enough. They have gone beyond the limits. They have overplayed their hand and Iran is heavily engaged and involved in that. Iran very much wanted a land bridge or a land a corridor to Syria, Lebanon and the Mediterranean. In fact, they were looking for a crescent and some of officials, they say that they have got the full moon. So we need to, we need to get to a situation when Baghdad realizes that the United States, which has invested a lot in Kurdistan region, needs to put a limit for this. And what we are asking for is not impossible. We ask that Erbil and Baghdad sit on the table and discuss the issues. We want to live. We want to live in peace based on the Constitution. Iraq is supposed to be a federal, democratic, and pluralistic country. But Iraq is not ready for that. Therefore, while we are calling for dialogue, they are building up troops. They are bringing more and more troops, Abrams, Humvees, and other tanks and other artillery with Iranian experts and different Shia groups which are all backed by Iran. And this is against the Constitution because the Constitution of Iraq does not allow Shia, does not allow militia groups to be formed. That's why we need an immediate ceasefire, withdrawal of these forces, and having a combined security mechanism between Peshmerga and the Iraqi army to provide security for these areas and also joint administration in the so-called disputed areas until the Constitution as a package would be implemented. Therefore, we are not asking for the impossible, but we are asking for the possible, but Baghdad does not listen to us. And if we, be if we believe that one country can do it, it's the United States. Therefore, we hope that you distinguished audience here, you play your role in communicating the message of a people who share the same values of democracy, freedom, women empowerment, rule of law, and transparency. I'm not claiming that what we have in Kurdistan region is perfect, but compared with the neighborhood that we live in, we are very much advanced in these values. Just imagine last week, the Iraqi parliament took a proposal on the personal status law that would allow a nine-year-old girl to be married. This is not something that we believe in, and this is not the country that we want to be part of it. That's why we share these values that you have fought for, and we believe that we deserve a future. But it's not only the political and military challenges we are facing. We are facing humanitarian challenges as well. As a result of the events of last month, 186,000 people from Kirkuk and Khurmatu have been displaced. These people need help and support. And two days ago, with the earthquake, 640,000 have been immediately or directly affected. They also need support. Nine people were killed and 540 people were wounded. The problems are increasing the support is decreasing, 
and Baghdad is not listening. We hope that with the attempts that we have made, Baghdad has been asking us to annul and nullify the referendum. It's not easy when over three million people went to the ballot boxes voting for their freedom and independence to tell them we disregard that. The KRG, in order to help and get to the negotiation, offered to freeze the results and to go to Baghdad and sit and negotiate on the basis of that constitution, but a constitution that would be implemented on the ground. Baghdad said that is not enough. Therefore, if the U.S. and other friendly nations would not exercise some pressure, Baghdad would not stop and destroy what we have built together. So I believe we need your help and the international community needs to act in order to save a democracy that is in being and also a nation that has suffered too much in order to be free. We have come a long way in a region which is very difficult, in a geographic location which is not easy, but we are proud that we have people who love their land the same way as Americans love, love their land. It's rich in human and natural resources, but we want to live in peace and freedom. And thank you. Minister, I want to thank you for that clarion expression of resilience, for reminding us of the importance of the culture of democracy that we share, and for sharing with us also the, the immense challenges, not only regional and political, but also humanitarian that you face, and yet you remain hopeful. Thank you. I would like to introduce now Kimberly Dozier, who's executive editor of Cypher Brief. And if you don't know Cypher Brief, you should go online and find out about it because it is one of the fastest growing must reads in Washington and elsewhere about intelligence and national security news and analysis. In addition, Kim has been CNN's global affairs analyst and recently uh, uh, with the AP and also Daily Beast after 17 years as an award-winning journalist with CBS News. Yay, CBS. Um, she has won the important awards, the Peabody Ed Edward R. Murrow Awards, and also was the first woman journalist recognized for the National Medal of Honor Society for her co coverage of Iraq. And that took courage, and we will hear an echo of, of perhaps her memoir, which I commend to you, when we hear at the end of our conference from Flo Gro Groberg. Kim? Minister, please join us in a little bit of conversation. Thank you. Minister. Thank you. It's great to be here tonight. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? No. no. Testing one, two, three. Um, so. No. No, still no. Still no. Um, I'll speak louder. So uh, one of the last times that you and I saw each other, you uh, hosted me at your offices in Erbil. Um, I was um, in and out of the outskirts of Mosul at the time. Yeah. So I was dressed rather um, uh, casually. His office is gorgeous. So when he brought in the official photographer to take a photograph, I was like, oh, really, I'm like in jeans, but OK, I'll take it. He tweets it at Fala Mustafa. Follow him if you want to know about Kurdistan. He is a prodigious tweeter. Um, and there I was um, in, a, in Bashika, a Christian yes. area. But it turns out it was a sensitive area. This was after our meeting. The next day, I drove in there. And coming out of the area, we ran into a checkpoint. 
And um, if you want to know the true power of this man sitting next to me. Now, the guards at the checkpoint, they didn't care about my press credentials. They didn't care about the CNN pass. They didn't think anything of my passport. I could see that my translator and my driver were turning white, sweating. I could hear the soldiers at the checkpoint getting angrier and angrier in a language I didn't understand, which is always a really bad thing for a foreign correspondent. And I'm thinking, what can I do to prove to them I'm a reporter? And then I remembered, oh yeah, Fala Mustafa tweeted that picture of me. So I'm like, madly going through my Twitter, I find the photograph and I'm like, look, really, I'm a journalist. And all I can hear is shrieking Fala Mustafa, shrieking Fala Mustafa. And the translators later told me, and they're ushering us quickly through. All of the roadblocks came up. <laughs> and so apparently what the guards were saying was, oh my god, she knows Fala Mustafa. Let her through. Thank you Thank again. You. So um, with that courtesy um, out of the way, I'm now going to ask you some tough questions. Please. Uh, I'd like to start back in 2005, the Iraqi Constitution. What did it promise you and what did it leave out in terms of where the border was to be between the Kurdish autonomous region and the rest of Iraq? Well, thank you. In fact, uh, in 2005, after the fall of the regime, we played a leading role in drafting a constitution that would be democratic, that would be federal, and we share the power and wealth. Yes, it did not meet all of our expectations, but we thought that it met some of the expectations of, the each, of each different groups in Iraq, Shias, Sunnis, Kurds, Christians, Muslim, Yazidis, all together. So we agreed that this would be the situation, but before the fall of the regime, there was a green line, a line that was demarcation line between Peshmerga forces and Iraqi army. It was set by Saddam. Yes. This was the, f the final military positions in between Peshmerga and the Iraqi army. <clears throat> but that was not the borders of Kurdistan. Borders of Kurdistan are known even if you go back to the old atlas of the Ottoman time. Okay, but the and borders article, were not put in the Iraqi constitution. No. Article 58 of the Tal, transitional administrative law, mm -hmm. after the fall of the regime, addressed that issue that this needs to be addressed properly, a three-stage process, mm -hmm. normalization of the situation, a census to be carried out, and a referendum whereby the people of these areas would say whether they want to be part of Kurdistan region or the rest of Iraq. It was not implemented during the tal, the transitional phase. It became Article 140 of the Constitution of 2005. That was supposed to be implemented before 31st of December 2007. Unfortunately, Baghdad was not ready for that, and they did not want it to be implemented, and that's why so, we are paying the price. So what they did, in other words, was they took a very tough question, and they kicked the can down the road. They didn't make the decision at the time. They, did they not. pushed it off for a future parliament, a future prime minister, a future Kurdish administration, and you always thought of your border as being in one location, mm. And every Iraqi always thought, thought of their border, uh, Iraqi as in from uh, Sunni from Baghdad, thought of it as another line. To be honest, we liberated the Northern Front. At that time, Turkey did not allow US troops to come from Turkey. Mm. Yeah. Because had they come, there I, would have I, been I, a confrontation between us and Turkey. I, I remember talking we, to a number of yeah. um, paratroopers so, who had intended to yeah. parachute in. A number of to. special forces came, and Peshmerga forces played a role in liberating mm. Nineveh. Kirkuk and Diyala provinces. But we promised the Americans that we will not stay there, we will withdraw to our positions, and we want a peaceful and lasting solution for these areas. We believed in the United States, and we told the United States, our problem is not with you, our problem is with Baghdad. The fact that we accepted these areas to be addressed disputed territories, not because we had any doubts about their belonging, but we wanted a peaceful and lasting solution. Baghdad formed a committee for that, they allocated funds for it, but they did not implement anything. And now there are on YouTube and social media statements from Iraqi officials saying we did not allow this article to be implemented. This is the problem. So they sign with you, they agree on something, but they don't deliver. So they agreed on, uh, this is why um, Ambassador Lukman Faley, former yeah. Iraqi ambassador to Washington, just wrote a, an op-ed about 
the abortive Iraqi constitution, where he talked about there are a number of different things left in it like that, that left these wide holes for people to drive through if they disagreed with ultimately figuring out where that border was supposed to be, which is one of the things you're now having to deal with today. It's, that's not the only issue, but mm. there were 50 articles in the Constitution that required laws to be passed. None of that happened. 55 articles of the Constitution have been violated. Therefore, we thought that we have no future. When you have the Constitution which is not adhered to, when you reach an agreement they would not abide by it, what does that mean? And I have to say that I have sat with Sunni politicians who say the exact same thing, which is why a number of their people joined ISIS, which it goes back to your point from your speech that a number of the things that, um, the fractures that caused um, ISIS to rise in the first place are still there. Yes, indeed, because uh, the Shias have taken control and they are not ready to share it. The only group in Iraq who wanted to share the power was Kurds, because Sunnis had the power before, Shias have the power now, and we have neither, we did not have it in the past and we will not have it in the future. And my prime minister says that we live in a country, we are obliged to live in a country, that the Sunnis have the fear of the future because they had the power in the past, they don't know what will happen to, the, to them in the future. Shias have the, the fear of the past, now they have the power. We Kurds, we have the fear of the past, present, and future. <laughs> a country that there is the element of fear and the element of trust and mistrust. How could you put it together? That's why it is important for people to realize that unity has to be voluntary. And unity yes. cannot be. When Sunni, in the Sunni areas, in the Sunni areas, there were peaceful demonstrations in 2012 asking for peace, for justice, for security and services. That was responded to by Prime Minister Maliki militarily. He put it within the context of war on terror. So let's segue. There has been a military response to your referendum. Yeah. Um, you've had almost daily clashes um, with, uh, I'm going to move this here and see if it doesn't echo as much. You've had almost daily clashes with Iraqi forces. The Iraqis have taken back, the Iraqi um, official security forces have taken back something like a quarter of the territory that you had managed to expand into while you fight, fought off ISIS, and you were fighting off ISIS because of the Iraqi army retreat. Mm -hmm. um, but Barzani resigned, saying that the referendum was a mistake. No, no. Uh, well, that's how it's been reported over here. And, and your government did accept the Iraqi federal decision that no part of Iraq may secede <clears throat> in early November. Well, uh, First of all, Iraqi army collapsed when ISIS came, Iraqi army, because it was not a national, professional, inclusive army. Let me we're just to explain okay. to the distinguished audience. The Iraqi army under Maliki, instead of becoming a national, professional, inclusive army, it became a Shia sectarian army. When ISIS came, the population in Sunni areas welcomed them and because they wanted not to the be free. If yes. not for the Peshmerga, I have heard from many American commanders, mm -hmm. American special operations commanders, that if not for you all, uh, much more of Iraq would have been lost. Absolutely. <laughs> well, uh, the point is that uh, the army was not based on proper foundations. That's why it collapsed. Sunni community, which suffered under the Shia, they welcomed the ISIS and they came and they saw them that they were the same while they came to save them. But Peshmerga defended the land and the people and protected and liberated these areas. We have an agreement with the, with the Department of Defense here that any area that would be liberated as part of Muslim operations starting as of 17th of October 2016, Peshmerga will withdraw from these areas. Okay. Unfortunately, when Iraqis came after the referendum, neither the Americans nor anybody told them this is the agreement that Peshmerga should only come back from these areas in coordination. And they told, them, told about the lines of 2014 when we went to the areas of ISIS. 
They did not, Iraq insisted they go back to 2003 line. This is the problem. We need the United States to play a very important role in making sure that Baghdad would not continue to push further. Because if they push further, it will break. They can take Kurdistan. We're proud of the Peshmergas. They have stopped Iraqis from coming in, but they have huge amount of weapons, advanced but, weapons, okay. ammunition. The point is that what next? But your government did accept the Iraqi federal <clears throat> court yeah. decision okay. that you can't secede. So now are we arguing over where the line will be? And you've shelved um, independence mm -hmm. for now? Because that's what it seemed like Barzani was saying. Well, uh, just to correct it, President Barzani did not say it was a mistake. We still believe that was the right thing, because we deserve a future of our own. We cannot be we cannot accept to be subjugated and subordinated to people who do not respect our identity or rights. My government f decided to freeze the results in order to help dialogue. Baghdad did not accept it. As a way out, we said that we will accept the ruling or we will respect the ruling of the Iraqi federal court in its interpreta interpretation of Article 1 of the Constitution that says Iraq is a federal uh, democracy or a federal republic, uh, etc. So this is, for the time being, this is what we, but believe me, Iraq will not remain like this. So there are two questions I have left before turning it over to the, opening it up to the audience. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the areas that you're talking about are not all Kurdish in population. They have a heavy Arab population as well, uh, mixed in. They're also um, very fertile farmland. Mm -hmm. And they have some of the largest oil deposits that ExxonMobil is actually um, uh, mining or drilling. So from Iraq's standpoint, why would they give that to you? Well, this is, we talk about the geographical boundary, a geographical area. It's not a nation state. In Kurdistan, we are proud that we are diverse. We have Kurds and non-Kurds, Muslims and non-Muslims living together in peace. This is a tolerant society, and we're proud of what we have introduced, not only in Iraq, but throughout the Middle East, that this is, anybody who has visited the region, they know that Kurdistan is proud of this culture of tolerance and accepting each other. Therefore, it's a geographical area, historically, demographically, and geographically, is known as Kurdistan. They cannot but be nice, so, but it's not only, and that's why we call my government Kurdistan regional government, not Kurdish regional government, because we have non-Kurds living together. We were treated as minorities, therefore we do not want to treat others as a minority. We tell them that they are equal partners. Just before the referendum, the leadership in Kurdistan approved and signed a manifestation for the rights and future of all these communities, that they have equal rights in everything, in administration, religious, national, and cultural. We believe in that. We do not preach, we practice. Now, you spent the last day, according to your Twitter feed, <laughs> meeting some pretty high profile people, including uh, the NSC's Middle East guru, Joel Rayburn, and some others at the White House. Remember, guys, at follow Mustafa. Seriously, follow it. Um, good discussion with National Security Advisor to VP Mike Pence and White House National Security Team on the need for a permanent ceasefire, comprehensive political dialogue to resolve the Erbil Baghdad issues, and proactive U.S. engagement in addressing longstanding challenges facing Iraq and Kurdistan. You're really happy Twitter expanded the number of characters, aren't you? Exactly. Well, am I allowed to tweet about this as well? Yes, I think so. <laughs> So, so how did it go? You, all of the things that I've been giving you a hard time about tonight, I know that you uh, have direct and frank conversation with them, and I know that a lot of U.S. officials feel guilty right now because they say the Kurds never let them down. So what did they tell you? The meeting was easier than your questions. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they believe in the partnership. They believe in our people, and we have developed a very strong tie. Peshmergas and U.S. soldiers, men and women in uniform, fought together. And we are proud of this relationship. And it's a partnership that we believe in. Yes, we were disappointed at the response of the United States. They could have 
prevented this from happening. They could have stopped Iraq from coming. Just to tell them, the Iraqi constitution does not allow for the use of force. But we have no better friend than the United States. And the United States has no better ally and partner in the Middle East. We believe in this partnership. We believe in this alliance. And we are proud that in Kurdistan, not a single American soldier or civilian has been killed or injured or even being insulted. All the losses that happened in Iraq, it was in other parts of Iraq and not in Kurdistan. That tells a story in itself. We are proud of the relationship. We are proud of the United States. And we love you. We love the United States. So that's why when we have a problem, we come to the United States. We ask for support. And we told them that time has come for you to engage and engage more directly and heavily. And we've asked even for a special envoy to be allocated so that they come and deal with the issue of Erbil Baghdad in itself. Because if you want to have influence in that part of the world, you can have it in Kurdistan. Kurdistan is your partner, is your faithful ally and friend. And in fact, before the withdrawal of American troops, President Barzani here at the Brookings Institute, he publicly stated we welcome American base in Kurdistan. When every other politician in Baghdad was asking Americans to leave, we publicly stated that. But what I have to ask is, what did they promise to do today? Did well, they just, just yeah. share it among us friends? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think uh, they believe in the partnership. They assured me that they are for a strong united KRG within Iraq and that they will continue to support us. They will work with Baghdad and Erbil in order to make sure that this will stop. And I have to admit that without their engagement, Baghdad could not have been stopped until now. Yes, we have a ceasefire, but Baghdad was trying to have a 24-hour ceasefire extended. But I believe your military, your diplomats have been putting pressure on Baghdad to stop military advances and start the dialogue. Yes, dialogue has not started, but thanks to the U.S. engagement, it has stopped. We believe that the United States can do, and they will, they will do it. I'd love, love to take a couple of questions from the audience. Um, how do we have microphones to head people's way? Uh, back there, nearest that microphone. And could you introduce uh, your name and where you're from? Okay. Um, Iman Gise. Oh, and please stand up. Iman Gise, World Affairs Council. Iman Gise, World Affairs Council, Greater Reading. Um, as a student, I'm often told that history repeats itself. And you have previously mentioned that um, recently independent countries stated that they were also told the time is not right. Is Kurdistan looking or modeling after previous separatist movements? And if so, which ones? And if not, what makes a separatist movement different? Well, I do believe that history repeats itself. And uh, for us, we live on our own land. We were divided against our will. History has been unjust to us. We know that the Middle East region is a volatile region, already suffers from lots of problems. We're not asking for greater Kurdistan. That would shake four countries in the Middle East. That would be too much. We're asking for each part to address its issues in such a way that they reach an agreement with the governments of these countries. But so far, none of them have been ready. The Iraqi Kurdistan has been more advanced than the others. So therefore, we believe when we talk about Kurdistan, we only talk about Iraqi Kurdistan to have it. This will not stop. Whether we have frozen or accepted the Iraqi ruling, this is temporary because the new generation in Kurdistan is not ready to accept to live under dictatorship or others to impose their will on us. Because we want to live in freedom. Iraqi parliament passed a law to ban alcohol. We in Kurdistan, we said no. This is not democracy. We do not want that. Or Ministry of Higher Education in Baghdad wanted to segregate, to uh, separate boys and girls, and also to uh, not allow women to wear miniskirts and trousers. This is not the thing that we want to live. This is not the democratic Iraq that we were promised. That's why we're asking to enjoy our rights. We, we want to live in a democracy. 
But for us, we sympathize with every movement or every nation that has suffered and they want to be free. But unfortunately, we do not have a seat in the UN to vote for them. But there is a lot of sympathy. Wherever there is a nation that fights for freedom, we support it. And in fact, we and the Catalonians had one week between us, and both of us have suffered. But I believe the nations, these nations will be free one day. Another question, okay, sir. It's uh, Ronan O'Malley from the World Affairs Council, Greater Houston. Uh, first of all, uh, for Minister Bakir, it's, it's really an honor to, to have you here with us today. And I think I would speak for most people here in this room. Most Americans are incredibly respectful and incredibly just awed of, of what the Kurds have done. Uh, a progressive form of government, kind of a liberal approach or progressive approach with regards to women in the region, you know, even fighting the front lines of the Persian America. Um, <clears throat> But I suppose I would get into this, the regional dynamics of it, whether it be Erdogan progressively getting more autocratic or Maliki and his followers of a Shia-dominated government and Iran-backed government for the, for the Iraqi government. Are you concerned that, especially with Bush and then Obama, and now perhaps even more so with the current administration, that the U.S. is going to favor stability over democracy, favor you know, regional stability over basically independent kind of uh, representational form of government? Well. Thank you, this is a very good question. In fact, the Middle East is in turmoil. And uh, we are seeing changes that we are not expected. In uh, Turkey, we have estimates are between 15 to 25 million Kurds living in Turkey. Iran, 12 million Kurds living in Iran, and seven and a half to eight in Iraq, and three million in Syria. We are for stability. In fact, not addressing the current problems between Erbil and Baghdad, that would lead to instability. And instability there means the, opening the door for extremism and terrorism to expand. The mountains of Kurdistan, if it were not for the Peshmergas, would have been full of terrorists. That's why I believe stability goes in line with our demand that we want stability, but with stability, we want our constitutional rights. Federalism is a system of governance. We were telling back that we want Iraq to be strong, but strong in its democratic institutions, strong in its commitment to rule of law, to transparency, to good governance, to empowerment of women. They think that a country can only be strong when they have a militarized society, when they have everybody armed. This is the different approach between us and them. We believe in the separation of religion and state, and also in getting the country to be strong in its values, in its principles, and also in its institutions. So I believe our interest goes in line with stability, provided that the Constitution would be implemented as a package. And uh, my prime minister was interviewed a couple of days ago. He said, unfortunately, in Iraq, the Constitution looks like a restaurant menu. Baghdad ticks the items that they want, and they leave, they leave the rest in the menu. This is not the Iraq that we want. We want the whole package of the Constitution to be implemented. Another question from a different part of the room. Um, sir, in the front row? Yes. yes. Uh, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> Here. Uh, no, that's okay. Oh, no, everyone needs to hear you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Greg Hudson, Naples Council of World Affairs. Uh, I just look at this over the last, oh, what, uh, 15 years, I guess, and I, I go back and when we went into Iraq, uh, however wise that was or wasn't, uh, we had a partner in the north, and, uh, and that was the Kurds. Uh, they assured stability there as our partners uh, at a time when there was anything but that between the Shia, uh, the Kurds, and the whole issue with the, the Ba'adis. Uh, fast forward uh, to Syria when we were not ready to put boots on the ground. But the Kurds were our boots on the ground. And so for some of us, recognizing fully the complications of that area, which are probably more profound and more challenging than ever to, to provide, I guess, a nod of, 
recognition to the difficulty of the decision making in our own government. At the same time, I as an individual, and I'm guessing an awful lot of people in this room would like to express their uh, gratitude to the, Tur to the Kurdish people for being our partners. Thank you. And in our hearts and prayers uh, are the fact that you will find your freedom and we will be still uh, friends in your heart and, uh, and uh, people who wish you well. So my follow-up question to that, sort of non-question, would be a um, strong statement. Do you think U.S. troops should put themselves in harm's way to protect you from Iraqi forces? Well, thank you for that statement, for your solidarity and support. And I believe the people of Kurdistan know that we have many friends here, friends in the administration, friends on the hill, friends like you in different walks of life. We believe in this partnership. And believe me, with all the disappointment that we had, because we believe the U.S. could have stopped Iraq from advancing. But yet, we did not want to issue statements. We did not want to put banners, because we love you so much. We still believe that you will come to aid us and to support us. The Middle East area suffers from a number of problems. When we look at Iran and Turkey, they have tremendous problems between them. One is the Persian Empire, the other was the Ottoman Empire in the past. Now one is leading the Shia world, the other wants to lead the Sunni world. Then go down south, Saudi Arabia and Iran, they have got their own problems. In Yemen, in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Libya, all problems. We are the safest among them. In the last 27 years, from 1991, we have proven to Turkey, to Iran, to Syria, that we are a safe neighbor. We want to live in peace and we want to coexist together. But the problem is that they don't accept this principle. We tell them that we want to be good neighbors, to have good neighborly relations based on respect, understanding, and mutual benefit. They tell us, no, you are not at our level, and we will dictate, and we will do your homework. Our problem with them is that they want to do the homework and to decide on our behalf. We tell them we are adults, we know what's good for us, and we want to make our own decision. So for us, this is the problem. We live in a neighborhood that, as a whole, is, is a difficult neighborhood. But we believe we have the future, because we believe in our land, we believe in our cause, and our men and women in uniform in the Peshmerga are ready, just like your men and women in uniform are ready to fight. We do not want, and we did not want, your boots on the ground. As you rightly mentioned, in Iraq and Kurdistan, Peshmergas were the boots on the ground. In Syria, the Kurds were again the boots on the ground. We need your support, your moral support, your support militarily to train and build the capacity of the Peshmerga to provide us the weapons to defend ourselves. This is what we want. Not your boots, but your moral support, political support, and economic support. Well, with that, I want to thank you. I think the sign of a true Democrat is to be able to take really tough questions, and you've taken many tonight. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. And thank you for enjoying being part of this debate.